Okay, so I want to show you guys something really cool. Um, hmm. I'm going to show you one lab marker that I have been testing in Tommy yearly, and I'm going to probably start doing it every six months. Uh, Willie's really excited about this. I just want to start by saying that functional lab testing is there as a tool. It is just one tool of many that we use with patients and clients in practice. It is not to diagnose, but it does give us a better idea of where we wanna focus with the patient or with the client. And so I, I think it's important to, to, to put that out there. And really that's where the practitioner comes in to sit down with the client and, pay, and say, you know, if you're gonna, if there's five tests that would be in a perfect world that you can do, and maybe because it's pretty costly, you only want to do one or two, we can kind of help you make that decision. And it really is going to depend on your symptoms, what conditions we're looking at and all of those things. Now in Tommy's sake, so I'm using him as an example here, there are specific ones that are going to be, that I've been doing the most of. Um, for ASD, you know, it's so multifaceted and I, I've talked about this before. We've got mitochondrial health. We've got gut, gut health is really sort of that, that main factor and I believe the catalyst to a lot of the issues that are going on, um, which is why the gut, so we've got, you know, GI maps and gut zoomers, which are stool tests. It gives us a, a lot of information on what's happening. This in the body, intestinal impermeability, um, we can look at food sensitivities, we can look at um, inflammation, inflammatory markers, deficiencies, and all of those. So I've been using, I love Great Plains, I love the oat test for a lot of these, looking at especially mitochondrial markers, neurotransmitter markers, all of these can be off kilter with the ASD patient. Um, not just ASD, but many, many conditions. And so when we're looking at someone, especially with a lot of this anxiety and depression that we're seeing, um, a lot of it is, of course, environmental. A lot of it is situational. It's, tr you know, trauma-induced. All of those things are true. Sometimes we can get a little bit of a glimpse, though, using an OATS test. What is off balance? And even more remarkable, we can, we can actually hone in to see how the environment and what we're eating and any other contaminants that are kind of coming in, how that's affecting it because it's affecting the enzymes. We can see it play out in real time. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today, looking at Tommy's glyphosate test. So this is one year ago, 2021. This is Tommy's glyphosate number, right? Now that might not mean anything yet, but I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of tease out a little what's what what the reason we want to lower this number is and exactly what I did to lower it. Um, this is not easy to, to um, get out of the body. In fact, it's even in the water system. The only water that really totally removes it is gonna be something like reverse osmosis. Really hard to get out of the body. So I wanna put that out there first. So this is a slow process. 3.5, this is where he was. Let me kind of pan over. So 3.5 is off this chart. This is baby off, off the charts. And now I'm gonna fast forward to our 2022 or the end of 2022 when he just got this like last month. And we are it, we are now, we've moved it basically one full point, right? Almost one full point to 2.6. Now you might be thinking, my God, that's not, that's not a ton, but for something like this, it's actually, it's actually pretty huge and we're moving in the right direction. And I'm gonna show you the oat test too, the other markers that have totally reversed. And I'll show you what I did for that. But I just wanna focus on the glyphosate for one second, because I wanna tell you the two things, the only two things that I changed an organic gluten-free diet. Now we were always pretty, you know, as organic as we can be, right? Um, I was a little bit more conscious um, and sort of upped the ante on that and as well as the gluten. So it was always like, you know, low gluten here and there. It was totally fine. But for the most part, he was 100% gluten-free. Occasional mishaps happen. Totally expect that. I totally expect things to happen when we're on vacation here and there. But for the most part, it was much more of a conscious effort to do that. The second thing is the intelligence of nature gut support formula. And I'm going to show you this and I'm going to unpack how it actually works. This was in their water. It doesn't taste like anything. We put it, I've talked about it many times. We, um, 
we put it in all of our waters in our aerator every single day it goes to school with them it comes um it goes in their waters when they come home and um th we did this on a consistent basis and i believe this is those two things are what are really helping move the needle on this first let's i want to just unpack some of this because there's lots of confusion on what this actually is what it does people think it's a probiotic um you know people are doing it they're not really sure why they're doing it <laughs> um, so i want to kind of i want to kind of help understand the whys behind what we do right it's all about the why so this is humic acid right this is the main ingredient that's in here or vulvic um vulvic acid and it begins with the formation of humates if you've heard of that term before which come from the compression and the decomposition of vegetation ancient vegetation so like things like trees and plants and seaweed that under certain geological conditions so things like temperature pressure this is what gives us the humic acid which is actually it's actually pretty high ph so it's not really acidic like the name indicates but actually it's pretty alkaline so i want you to think mineral rich for the nerds here we go this is the structure of the humic acid okay so this is a negatively charged structure which helps it to attract and bind to things like calcium and iron which are positive ions right so right off the bat these are loaded with macro and trace minerals which honestly more people than not are deficient in. And I say this because the food that we eat today, I do talk about this all the time, is so commercialized that it doesn't even have a fraction of the minerals that it had 100 years ago. So humid, humic acids are the product of an 80 million year old process. So it's literally like something from another time and place, right? <laughs> minerals. Uh, another, what I call mechanism of action is how it actually acts upon the plant roots to I mean, essentially make nutrients available for it. And this is where the negative charge comes in. So it binds to those nourishing minerals and actually helps the plant flourish. And there's lots of things that you can read about that, how they actually use this in agriculture for that purpose. Okay, so breaking down the structure here, we've got three functional groups. We've got our carboxylic group. We've got our um, amino group nestled in the center. And then this part is particularly interesting. This is our phosphonate group here. And this is used in, in um, industry a lot because it's easy to work with, okay? So looking at this, now over to the site, okay? So here's glyphosate. So we wanna know now, how does this ion interact with glyphosate? So I first wanna do just that quick little review what it is, okay? Um, we know that this is the pesticide that's in Roundup. And for more info, please see this blog post because I walk you just through the basics and why we need to now actively actively minimize exposure pan out here just a little bit so we're seeing connections even in the last couple of years between glyphosate exposure from food water and basically all over the environment and and the connections to chronic disease and this includes not just neurological disorders like asd of what i talk about a lot um and dementia parkinson's um things like insulin resistance fatty liver obesity adrenal insufficiency and then of course cancer, since it is a class 2A carcinogen, right? And that, yeah, that means basically, oh yeah, it probably causes cancer. That's basically what that means. Stay with me. I wanna talk about other disruptions here. So here's a little more fun stuff. So many pathways, many pathways in the body are affected by glyphosate, one of which, and I've talked about this one before, the cytochrome P450 pathway, which is a primary. If we think about the freeways in LA, it's like one of the, one of the major, it's like the 405 freeway, right? Getting stuff out of the body, although the 405 is usually crammed, um, which is basically what this is doing, right? So it's making like, it's kind of like the 405 at rush hour what it's doing is it's messing with these enzymes that are needed to make these reactions take place. Additionally, it messes with the synthesis of amino acids. Okay, pretty important. And then the synthesis of sulfate from sulfite. So that flip flight, that flip flop from sulfites to the more protective sulfates, it messes with that little flip flop there. 
Um, and let me see if I can actually find you guys a visual because this is really common with ASD kiddos. Great visual, but basically in order to make that happen, that change, that switch from sulfite to sulfate, we need this enzyme, sulfite oxidase. And this enzyme has a cofactor and that cofactor is molybdenum. And glyphosate is a chelator to molybdenum. So it basically binds to molybdenum. And actually, Tommy is very deficient in molybdenum. molybdenum. And um, it's very, um, again, common to see these patterns with, um, with kids with neurological differences. Up, back, out of the rabbit hole, we come back to glyphosate. So, um, okay. Meantime, while all of this is going down, we have two rock star antioxidants in the body, glutathione, which is what we've, which is what most people have heard of by now, and superoxide dismutase, another rock star. It decreases the activity of both of those antioxidants. About some more things, but I hope you're still with me because I think that this, it's really, really important to unpack these things because it's sort of with this type of thing and many others, it is, it's more of that slow unraveling that's happening in that you won't necessarily see these things happening. What Stephan Stephanie Seneff calls basically like the slow death. Like it's not something that you're hit over the head with something and all of a sudden you feel it. But in super sensitive populations like ASD, those, it's going to manifest and you're going to start to see the implications of what's what this chemical is doing inside the body. Back to this, so one of the other concerns is the disruption of protein synthesis of this little guy here, this tiny little amino acid glycine, because you can see their structures are very similar, except this one has, like we talked about, that additional functional group. So basically the body ends up grabbing, grabbing glyphosate instead of glycine, essentially destroying this protein, you know, it's now null and void and it can't do its job. Um, the, this cascade then, of course, is going to interfere with those P450 enzymes that I mentioned and their connection to a whole host of diseases, right? Actually, one of the mechanisms of action of glyphosate is that it works on that shikimate pathway, which is basically inside the gastrointestinal tract. By the way, those bacteria, the bacteria inside our tract, are, they're responsible for the aromatic amino acids, things like, you know, tryptophan, which makes serotonin, and tyrosine, which makes dopamine. These are important neurotransmitters, which determine our, our state of mind, like literally in real time. So things like anxiety, depression, both of which have skyrocketed, can be environmental, right, via our food system, not just genetic brain chemistry, um, trauma, all of those things, of course, play a role. But I think people sort of overlook what they're, you know, what's happening in their environment, what they're, what they're ingesting, what they're eating, what they're breathing. Made it here. I don't ever like to bitch and moan without, without giving you some um, hope and some relief and, and um, hopefully some support. And I'll show you, I'm just showing you what I did. So we're going back to the ion and I'm gonna show you exactly how this works um, to sort of unravel all of those things that I just talked about. So humic acids, humic acids, adsorb, right? They are adsorbers. So that means they bind to glyphosate. They bind to glyphosate, which then of course, by default is going to decrease the negative impact on the microbiome right off the bat. Okay. We actually use humic acids in agricultural settings. We, so we had talked about that a little bit before to remove glyphosate from the soil. So it's used for many reasons. And that's of course, one of them to remove the glyphosate from the soil. Uh, now you're actually in this form, you're ingesting it. So this is the humic acids and that little magnet comes in near those tight junctions, those tight junctions. This is just a better image. I've showed you guys this before. Um, and then it's going to neutralize the antimicrobial effects of the glyphosate, right? We know that glyphosate toxi uh, toxicity contributes to things like dysbiosis, right? that balance, in other words, between the good and bad bacteria. Those bacteria is actually clostridium. And so, um, again, I go back to ASD and that that's another 
um, marker that's always high are the clostridium markers. When we look at that um, functional oat test, we can see those metabolites um, and we see high clostridium in this population. And so it all connects, everything connects back to this high glyphosate. So ion we use with success. We're gonna continue to use it. And I'm gonna do this test in another six months, maybe even four months and see, hopefully it's going to continue to go down. I've put this on here before, but I will probably re-record this because I've talked before about clostridium and how it affects that dopamine hydroxylase enzyme, which converts, I know I'm going a little rabbit hole, another little rabbit hole, but just stay with me because it really does come full circle, right? The dopamine um, over to norepinephrine, right? And so a lot of these kiddos have this circulating dopamine and that enzyme that helps to convert it to norepinephrine, it's, n it's not functioning because of this clostridium. And I will show you the visual. I've actually done it before, but I will come back. I'll probably re-record that one sort of as a part two to this. And I will show you how those labs and how what, what happened there. And that's like amazing. And I'll show you what I did. So um, I know it's a lot of stuff, guys, but gluten-free diet, ion those two things if if we were you know to start is what I would do with not just ASD kids but basically basically everyone and you can do because I know people have asked me this before practitioner uh if they have a great planes account um I do you can uh, you know of course anyone who's working with me if you ever want to do a glyphosate test for your kids or yourself it is um it's just a simple urine test so very easy peasy to do message me with questions